Thank you, everybody, for being here and spending part of your Saturday with me. I um, just want to first and foremost thank Tom and Eden and the entire team that put this amazing event together for us all this weekend to come together and talk about all of this interesting stuff. Pow, 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 pow. Ooh. My name is Kobe, um, Kobe Michael. Looks like we're up here, all good, all right. So I wrote a book called The Poison Path Herbal um, that you can check out up front. My specialty, my area of interest and expertise um, is in magical practice, occultism, uh, plant-based spirituality, uh, my mo main focus being poisonous plants. Um, so that could be anything from deadly nightshade to tobacco to cannabis to any sort of a, a plant with, with active constituents that has in one way or another kind of landed it in this sort of gray area between poison and medicine. Uh, we had a presentation earlier today on some of the medicinal benefits of various poisonous plants uh, with Amy Ostara Moon. Uh, we'll be talking about a couple of the plants that Amy mentioned, as well as a few extra ones. Oh, if I don't pass out from me. Ah! But then I can hear myself and I... <laughs> You're welcome. It's okay when it's playing back, but when I'm hearing it like live action, it's kind of spooky. So my main area of interest is the nightshade family. So this would consist of plants, deadly nightshade, Atropa belladonna, um, henbane, Hyoscyamus niger, mandrake, mandragora, officinarum, autumnalis, um, as well as the Datura species. Those are kind of the main core plant allies that I work with and the sort of main interest to the, the professional and teaching and research work that I do is, is really based around those specific plants. Um, they would be known as the witching herbs or hexing herbs uh, because they are associated with medieval witchcraft so these would have been plants that would have been common knowledge at the time that would have been widely known for their medicinal effects um, used topically and internally uh, for various different purposes. Um, so they've got all of this medicinal value, um, but they also have the ability to alter consciousness, to change our perception, and to help us connect with uh, certain energies, certain spiritual entities, um, however you want to kind of categorize them. So for me, it is a very animistic approach, um, being that all of the plants have their individual spirit as well as kind of their, their overarching consciousness that we are tapping into. Um, so just like with all of the, the plants and fungi and other uh, substantia or pharmaca um, that we've been talking about this weekend so far, uh, there are certain ones that people resonate with, uh, certain ones that people feel called to work with over others uh, for various different reasons. And it's kind of investigating those reasons of either attraction or repulsion or revulsion um, that we're able to really learn a lot about ourselves um, through the way that the plant spirits communicate to us. Uh, and they have many various different ways that they can do that. So uh, through myth, through folklore, through symbolism, uh, through tradition. So just sort of the accumulated esoteric correspondences that a plant or fungi uh, develop over the course of history. Uh, so for me, in my personal practice, the, the desire and interest to work with these plants came from a, a desire to connect specifically with spirits associated with witchcraft. 
uh, witchcraft being a, a global phenomenon that goes by various different words um, depending on the language and the part of the world, uh, but as a concept, as these people that are able to tap into these spiritual forces for a specific intention, uh, for you know, various different means, um, sometimes practical, sometimes spiritual, um, kind of getting to the core of that and researching some of the, the folklore and history to how people in the past have worked with plants like henbane, deadly nightshade, um, datura, and how, how we can use our modern understanding of phytochemistry and altered states of consciousness combined with herbal energetics, astrology, all of these different things that we have to kind of draw from to really get the, the most benefit, the most insight, growth, healing, whatever it is that you're looking for or not looking for um, out of these plants. Uh, so they've got all of these different sort of means of communicating to us um, that we're able to tap into. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly and save uh, time at the end for questions because that's usually when the best stuff kind of comes out. Um, so my background is in religious studies. I've been a magical practitioner since I, before I could drive. Um, so that's always been kind of a, a side area of interest. Clutching this mic, I'm going to crush it. Oh, I haven't smoked any weed today either, so that's new. <laughs> That's what the sweats are, really. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be lucid for everyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> entheogens, pharmacon, psychedelics, all of these different um, fancy words that we use to describe these plants, fl fungi. Um, I don't want to leave the fungi out, but I'll probably just use plant interchangeably for all of that, so I don't have to keep saying plants and fungi. Um, so differences and similarities between entheogens, pharmacon, and psychedelic. So psychedelic being mind manifesting uh, is where the sort of meaning and root of that word comes from. And manifestation is a very important part of magical practice um, because that is literally what we are doing. Um, we're taking something that is in our mind or something that doesn't exist yet uh, in our immediate vicinity or in the world out there and through ritual, through intention and focus and through these plant allies, we're bringing those things into being. So entheogen comes from the Greek uh, entheos, entheogenesthai, uh, which means to generate the divinity within. Uh, so we're creating these divine experiences. Uh, it could be for healing, it could be for spiritual growth, advancement, initiation. Uh, it could be to go for you know, not only the, the individual, but the community to kind of retrieve and bring something back that's going to be beneficial for everyone. Um, so they do have this, this kind of religious aspect to them, um, uh, which we would call theistic or deity-centered. Um, so with the entheogen or entheos, um, it's very much, a, I think, a singular expression of divinity um, when we look at the, the actual etymology of the word. Um, but with this, we're taking a very animistic approach. So the plants have their own unique consciousness and spirit that we are interacting with and initiating into these different relationships with. So honoring that um, entity, that consciousness, is a very um, important part. And they do all have very different characteristics, very different qualities. Um, those could be attributed to the sort of collective memory of the plant spirits in general, just things that they've accrued over time. Uh, it could also be due to, um, you know, just the, the various different ways that, that people have used them and worked with them over history. Um, so we can take a very kind of 
reductionist approach to working with entheogens and pharmacon or pharmaca, uh, which is more or less synonymous. We'll get a little bit more into the, the word meanings here on the next slide. Um, but we can also look at it as tapping into to aspects of the self. So everything has a spirit, essentially. Um, we have a spirit. This has a spirit. Um, and we are, we're connecting with it. We're all interacting in the same sort of divine soup um, that we're floating around in. So we can look at some of these plant and fungi allies that we gravitate towards uh, as manifesting aspects of ourself that we identify with or would like to identify with. Uh, they may also be reflecting back aspects of ourself that we are not so fond of. Um, and that's where the work with the, the poisonous plants, the baneful herbs, really kind of gets interesting um, and messy because they are, are very much poisonous, deadly, and, you know, in some cases used for, for very malefic ends. So that's part of their story. That's part of their spirit. Uh, so we're able to connect to some of these darker parts of ourselves or deeper parts of ourselves that we need to either learn more about um, or to heal in some way. Uh, and that's kind of the idea of, of connecting with some of these poisonous plants. Um, so just speaking of the nightshade, al or nightshade family and tropane alkaloids, um, they do have consciousness altering effects. Um, they would definitely be considered a, a trip um, they are more so deliriants than they are hallucinogens or psychedelics. Um, so with that, there is a very profound, noticeable change in perception and altering of consciousness. Uh, but because of the, the deliriant nature, there's also an amnesic effect. So you're having this really profound experience, but you don't actually realize that anything is out of the ordinary. Um, so for example, speaking to disembodied people that you know from like your day-to-day -day life, just having a regular conversation, and then the next thing you know, you turn over, turn around to, to get their response, and you're just talking to an empty chair. Um, that's an example of the delirium that you could experience uh, with an overdose of tropane alkaloids. Um, there's a reason that these aren't as popular as magic mushrooms, LSD, MDMA, all of the things that make you feel really, really good um, because their side effects are rather uncomfortable. <clears throat> uh, so a lot of the, the characteristic side effects of nightshade toxicity are going to be sweating, <laughs> red skin, um, I promise I haven't taken any nightshades. This is just me being a fire sign. Um, dilation of pupils, blurred vision, so you can't see close up. Um, as Amy mentioned earlier, it's used, they are collectively used to treat a number of gastrointestinal issues. Uh, so in small doses, that's great if you have like IBS or an upset tummy or um, you know, even, even Parkinson's related things. Uh, but on higher doses, what that means is that you have this intense need to urinate, but no matter how hard you try or how much water you drink, you will not be able to until it's gone. <laughs> um, so they have a lot of these really kind of uncomfortable side effects that go along with them. And those come from internal ingestion. Um, so drinking a tea, tincture, eating fresh plant material, um, very, very different when we ingest them internally and when we're dealing with fresh plant material. Um, that's why uh, in historical sources, we typically see these plants in reference to the witch's flying ointment, which is always used topically. Um, you know, throughout the Americas, just talking about datura, it's typically uh, either smoked or prepared in some type of a, a drinkable beverage, which there's a little bit of, of wiggle room uh, for that. Uh, but they do have very, very different, very intense sort of effects on consciousness. So what does that mean for being a magical practitioner, being a psychonaut, being a spiritual psychedelic person that's wanting to connect to um, the spirit world. Uh, 
How are those going to be different? Well, they're going to operate on a more chthonic or terrestrial level um, than some of our more psychedelic, um, I use psychedelic uh, to refer to things that, that give us, open us up more to sort of the celestial, galactic, interdimensional consciousness and entities and things like that. The Nightshade family is more interested in the, uh, I call it sublunar or terrestrial, um, sort of the goddess wisdom, the wisdom of the earth, the wisdom within, the wisdom of the ancestors, uh, many different traditions. Uh, this is serpent wisdom or Ophidian Gnosis. Um, and that is sort of the realm of these plants. So they are more concerned with, with the deep, the dark, um, layers of consciousness as opposed to you know blasting off to some other place so everything that happens happens very much right here um, in the here and now but you've just got a lot of other things going on um, while that's happening at lower doses at um, safe doses topical doses they can be beneficial for entering into trance states enhancing meditation um, spirit contact so another one of the sort of side effects or, or things that people experience at higher doses of tropane alkaloids are um, auditory hallucinations and visual hallucinations. Um, so you're not only seeing things, but you're hearing things as well. Um, so you're really getting, you know, not only information download, but actual like audible voices talking to you. Um, so that can be a little intense. <clears throat> Uh, they are associated with the oracle at Delphi, and I think that we could probably associate, you know, almost all of these entheogens to you having an origin there. They were probably mixing them all together, um, henbane, cannabis, all of those things. Uh, so it can be entheogenic or it can be extheogenic. So the entheogen creates divinity within us. Um, it brings the divine to us. With the extheogens, we're taking a little bit more of a practical approach, so we're still bringing that entity, that energy, that consciousness into the ritual space, but then it's being directed towards something um, more specific. So we see a lot of religious and magical uses of these plants in the ancient world. Um, just a few different examples. The famous molly, um, not to be confused with MDMA molly. This would be pronounced moly, I suppose, uh, in the Odyssey, used to protect against Circe's pharmaca, um, which would have also been plants in the nightshade family. Uh, mandrake, of course, is one that was known throughout the ancient world for its aphrodisiac properties. It was used as a fertility enhancer um, to get pregnant, um, to have sex, to enjoy it more. Um, so we see these pocula amatoria or love potions that were used throughout the ancient world that contained all of these different psychoactive pharmaca that were used in ceremonies of celebration, uh, sexual rites, and various different religious cults from um, the Eleusinian mysteries to uh, you know, cult of Isis, um, Dionysius. Wow, that was a stretch. Um, so they are often used to communicate with the divine, to communicate with spirits, whether that be for, for healing or knowledge or something to, to that effect. Um, the famous Nepenthes, we also see that used as a potion of forgetfulness, uh, which also has a parallel to the the river Styx in the Greek underworld, uh, which is the river of forgetfulness. And when we talk about henbane, I will mention that again. Um, I mentioned Chrysame, who defeated the Ionians at Erythrae. Uh, she was one of the Thessalian witches that we actually have historical record of um, that helped to win a battle um, by essentially tricking and drugging the enemy army um, so that they were incoherent enough that they were able to be defeated. Um, so in the ancient world, knowledge of these pharmaca or entheogenic plants and fungi 
was something that would have been widely known, but also something that would have been closely guarded. Um, so anyone could go out and know where these plants grow and collect them and bring them back and prepare them and ingest them and go out and do their thing. But that was very much looked down upon in the ancient world. Um, as much as it is kind of today with the, the Catholic Church sort of holds the keys to heaven. Um, it was the sort of the equivalent in the ancient world that these entheogenic sacraments were to be used in a specific way in a group setting to interact with state-sanctioned deities uh, for various religious purposes. So anybody that would go out and do that on their own, go to the cemetery or to go out into the wild um, to kind of on an individual basis connect with these plant allies, they would often be demonized, ostracized, and kind of looked at as this sort of crazy, unwanted, dark influence that was doing these things that was not necessarily to the benefit of the rest of the community. So that's where we really start to get early ideas about witchcraft and about taboo kind of magical practices um, in Greek being referred to as goetic, um, the people being referred to as the goes. Um, now we see that term used more so in demonolatry, uh, where a lot of the, these various demonic entities are associated with um, Goetia, or the Ars Goetia. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm making your job so hard. <laughs> Stay still. Uh, so, manifestation in comparison to sorcery. Let me go back just a step from that. So, separating kind of the approved religious practices, or not even approved religious practices, just working with, with entheogens for entheogenic purposes, to connect with Mother Nature, to connect with the goddess, the god, uh, whatever, however you... Um, perceive that or experience that is sort of its its own separate thing. Um, there are definitely like parallels or areas that that bleed over uh, when it comes to to magical practice but sort of for this presentation just differentiating between simply um, consuming a sacrament in a spiritual setting for the experience for the entheogenic effects versus consuming the entheogenic sacrament with a specific intention with specific actions put in place to then manifest that intention um, through spiritual allies through just our own ability to you know, alter and create the universe um, because we are made in the images of the gods and we are capable of creating and co-creating uh, just like they are. So we can look at this kind of in two different ways. We could take more of the, the psychological manifestation, um, just kind of focused thought idea um, so we're taking an altered state and focused intention, and we're tapping into that universal connection. Um, so we don't even have to put a name to that because we all know what that is for ourselves. Um, so when we combine all of those things, we're able to manifest things in our life, to make changes, um, to bring in wanted things, um, and also to to deal with and remove unwanted things. Um, so that's great, and that has a lot of application and a lot of its own sort of ritual um, approach to how to do that. Um, when we look at sorcery, we are taking the altered state. Um, of course, there is focused intention in ritual magic, which is, um, I've mentioned, the ritually communicated intention. Um, but then we also have the addition of spirits, deities, elemental forces, um, and that idea of, of interacting with something that is not of us or not necessarily within us um, and has, you know, a different vibration, a different characteristic. Um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm just very animistic. It's all about, you know, spirit relationships, partnerships. This isn't done in a, a devotional way for me personally. Um, these are more so 
to call to call it a business transaction is to do like an extreme like sort of injustice but i was speaking to someone outside earlier and it's, i don't really work with with deities or divinities uh, in a devotional capacity. So I don't have a specific God or goddess or spirit that I identify with and work with on a very regular basis. For me, it is who has the best skills, the best knowledge for the thing that I'm trying to do, or who embodies most fully um, this, this thing that I need to embody in order to bring this thing into my life. Um, so when I'm working with, with spirits in that way, it's generally, um, you know, a mutually beneficial, mutually sort of exchanged kind of co-creation, um, you know, where I'm not necessarily doing all of these offerings and petitions and things on a very regular basis with a specific entity. Um, so it's very much a, a, a folkloric or animistic approach to working with spirits and deities. Um, just a little bit more, like I kind of mentioned, experiential versus ritual practice. Um, so in general healing, communion, insight, and gnosis can all be found via the experience itself. Um, so this is something that unfolds and something that comes through. Um, we can interpret it, we cannot, we can just take it for what it is, we can integrate it, we can do all of those things, but it kind of unfolds. Um, you know, its own storyline. We can set a direction, we can set an intention, um, but the idea here is that we're going on a journey. Um, we may not know everything that we encounter, we may not know all of the, the quests and the trials that we are presented with through that journey, um, but it's about the experience. Um, so with active ritual practice, we are taking that journey, <laughs> um, but we're also saying, you know, there is this specific thing, um, this specific energy, maybe it's a goal, maybe it is a different life, a new job, um, to, you know, sort of unravel all of your... just messy, nasty stuff. Um, you know, so we can ask for these things very specifically and show the spirits, you know, that we are willing to kind of step up and ask for what we need. And oftentimes when you ask, you shall receive. Um, so when we combine the power of ritual practice with psychedelic states of consciousness, we tap into something powerful and primal beyond description. Our magic is elevated past the mythological and metaphoric. Lots of different techniques to how you could incorporate this. Um, you know, a lot of these are going to kind of seem just like similar common things that would happen in, in almost any plant medicine ceremony. Um, you know, a lot of times in, in ceremony, people will, will bring journals, they will bring divinatory tools, they'll bring their special crystals, their, their power objects and things like that into the ceremony space because of the support, because of what it means to them. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in this case, we are tapping into some of these techniques to um, work the actual ritual, but then also kind of get insight to it. Um, so just a few examples being chanting, singing, uh, making mouth noises, um, automatic writing, which is uh, just taking a piece of paper or notebook and kind of free form, um, free flow thoughts, just writing what comes to mind. Uh, I'll often do that during most of my ceremonies, um, whether it's for a specific magical intention or if it is more so um, an experiential thing. I like to write everything down because a lot of things um, come through uh, during those processes. Of course, uh, different symbols, sigils, glyphs can be drawn and created during the ceremony. Um, these are really powerful tools to use, especially when you are on psychedelics, um, because we're literally um, calling this energy in, creating this focused intention, and then creating a symbol that represents that. And we're pouring all of that energy, all of that kind of in intense and enhanced um, state of consciousness that we're getting through the plant medicine and then pouring it into that thing that now represents our goal. Um, yeah. 
and think out think outside of the box with the goals. It doesn't have to be like money magic, protection, uh, love magic, that sort of thing. We can you know we can think a little bit bigger. We've got you know really really simple quick money spells that can make it happen fast that we don't need to to do the psychedelic thing for. So more so um, you know spiritual growth, spiritual power, um, you know learning new methods of healing, learning new ways to connect with other spirits. Um, you know, in a, in a lot of cases, these plant allies act as intermediaries for one another. Um, you know, one may come through, may have a, a belladonna spirit come through during an Amanita ceremony, or you may do a psilocybin ceremony and then bring Datura into the ritual space. So then you've also got the spirit of Datura. Um, you know, so we can utilize some of these <clears throat> entheogens or pharmacon or psychedelic substances that we're already kind of familiar with to connect with um, other spiritual consciousness. So one of the things that I like to do with working uh, with the, the more poisonous plants or low-dose herbs is actually incorporate them into the ritual space physically um, or either through like the use of flower essences, ritual oils, ointments, and things like that. Um, bring them in in a low dose capacity where we're not having to worry about poisoning ourselves, um, but then we're also bringing in the, the mushroom allies to kind of create that, that entheogenic state of consciousness. And now we've got this really powerfully charged, um, you know, vibrational formula or tool, or maybe even like the living um, plant itself, if you have like a potted plant that you bring into the ceremony space. So all of those things that you surround yourself with and bring into that area are things that you can draw from, things that will communicate to you um, and give you kind of these little insights and, and tweaks into how to pursue this, this ritual further. Um, of course, divinatory tools, so it could be runes, tarot, pendulum, scrying, um, however you, you peer into the abyss is totally um, acceptable for that. And that kind of goes along with the journaling too. Um, so I'll do a ceremony um, startup divination at the very beginning where I'll just do like a two or three card pull, write that down, and then I'll go about like my set up my ritual space, bless and thank the, the substantia, consume that, um, sit in prayer, do different um, incense offerings, tobacco, just kind of depending on who and what I'm working with um, to get everything started and then go through the, the journey, the process, um, kind of dealing with things as they come up. So that sort of initiates the process, um, the initial kind of casting of the, the spell, and it bleeds out into the rest of your life. So all of the things that happen, all of the things that you gather during that ceremony then have application to, you know, what's going on weeks, months, years, maybe um, down the road. So all of this information, you know, that we're gathering, that we're writing down, even if it's like you drew a pretty picture, uh, we'll have some kind of insight or application later on, because these are generally uh, messages from spirits, messages from the plant allies coming through uh, that can then be later interpreted. So basically just kind of getting all of that down uh, and then going through the ceremony and then kind of coming back, circling back to kind of like editing when you're sober. I forget who said that earlier today. Um, so yeah, just coming back and revisiting all of that stuff and it can be really, really, really profound. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a few different plants relatively quickly. Uh, I think they're plants that everyone is familiar with. Um, and these are just some of my experiences and associations. Uh, they can be vastly and dramatically different for each individual. Um, so starting with Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric mushroom, yes, yes, <laughs> um, definitely one of my favorites. So just very simply, uh, rituals that are excitatory, arousing and energizing. Um, so think like dancing, drumming, moving, um, sexuality, just cel very celebratory kind of things go really great with the Amanita, but it also does have sort of a, a sedative, relaxant, and, and dreaming kind of effect too. Um, and this is all gonna be very dose dependent. Uh, what you'll see on the right is one of my plant spirit glyphs. 
Uh, so those were ritually constructed symbols, glyphs. Uh, you could call them sigils, even though they're not really meant to be destroyed. Um, but they're constructed using a basic sigil-making technique. So I took the word Amanita muscaria, muscaria, and I crossed out all of the vowels and all of the recurring letters, um, broke those down into their most rudimentary parts, so basically like vertical, diagonal, horizontal, and curved. And then I put those back together um, in a way that sort of creates this ideogram or pictograph that then represents the spirit, the energy, uh, and the capacity of Amanita muscaria. Um, Anyone can create these. Uh, you could use mine as sort of a meditative mandala if you're trying to connect with one of these plant allies. Uh, but you can also create your own, and that sort of co-creative process of making these is um, something that is really beneficial to developing a deeper connection to the spirit um, in question. So for me, Amanita, very much ancestral connection, berserker strength going into battle. Um, so this is the kind of thing that the, the wounded warrior would consume um, to recover from a really, really hard, grueling battle. Um, so in modern day, we could uh, equate that to any number of, of traumatic things that we go through being modern human beings, um, fill in the blank. So they give us this strength, they give us this frenzy, um, they give us this, this arousal, this um, exhilaration that, that really just lasts and bleeds through into the, the week, days, weeks, and, and time after the ceremony. Um, and that's something that can be really beneficial to tap into, especially when you're dealing with things like trauma, addiction, abuse, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Uh, it does have a gentle side to it. It's not all berserker strength and excitatory, arousing, um, angry, uh, but it is uh, also healing and restores our connectivity to Mother Earth. So with this one, uh, my experience with it was in a, a Norse plant medicine ceremony, I guess you could call it that. They're kind of plant medicine ceremony, and they just brought in some different... Um, pagan elements from, from Northwestern Europe. Uh, so it wasn't by any means like an official ceremony, but that was the, the theme of it. Uh, so that was super duper powerful for me, but I noticed like a really big sort of split between the energy of the room and that it was almost like catapulting me back and forth between like these very um, nurturing, feminine, um, just for lack of a better term. I was one of the only well, the person doing the ceremony and then me to um, males and everyone else was, was female and they were doing a lot of um, work with the, the, the womb and healing trauma in that. And um, it wasn't even something that was verbalized, but um, the group that I was with, you know, it was something that was, that was worked on, you know, leading up to that as well. But it was very much like this back and forth between it feeling like this really intense, just like, feminine, nurturing, mother sort of energy, um, and then going back to this very like animalistic, wolf-like, um, what I felt as, as being masculine energy. And what I was, was noticing was that as the energy was passing around the room, um, anytime like this very sort of feminine feeling would come up, it would automatically bring up like this angry, berserker, um, almost like a desire to like protect and defend, like this sort of prowling, prowling around kind of feeling. So it was really interesting just kind of back and forth um, for me with that. Uh, so quick little personal story on the Amanita. Um, I did that ceremony in February, and prior to that I'd been taking Kratom for the past two, three years. I was on it last time I was here. Um, yeah, <laughs> and I worked with the Amanita, and it was really crazy timing because my dad had just died at the beginning of February, and that was just like a, its, its whole own class, but I was able to almost kind of like piggyback on that with the Amanita, um, because my dad was an alcoholic, and there's a lot of like addiction stuff that just sort of ran all the way down through to me, um, and I got all of it, and 
really kind of just finally break through and cut through that that pattern and that connection to that person because so many of those things were were wrapped up in 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 who he was and who that meant I was and 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 so on and so forth. So super awesome shout out for Amanita. Um, it's one that yes. <laughs> The, the hanged one, death posture, underworld travel, we'll skip that. I'll talk about it if anybody wants me to at the end. Atropa belladonna, deadly nightshade, is my favorite. It is my main plant spirit ally. Um, it's the reason that I'm here doing this. Um, back in 2017, I did a ceremony on Halloween when I was living down in Florida with deadly nightshade. Um, I saw a bunch of, of dark spirits, shadow people, uh, what I would consider, or what most people would call demonic entities. Um, so very dark, very very dark themes and et cetera. Um, but it sort of initiated this process of getting me on the path that I am on now that led to me writing the Poison Path Herbal and really like pouring myself into working with, with nightshades and um, other plants that are like them. Um, so a little bit different than, than magic mushrooms and LSD, and because of my history with addiction and other um, substances, for lack of a better term, uh, I had kind of this probably decade-long break between um, you know, using any kind of, of psychedelics. And it was through that that I came to develop a closer relationship with some of these plant spirits. Now we see another belladonna glyph. Psilocybin, of course. Mushrooms in general are just really awesome to connect with other plant allies. Um, so if you pick up my book, The Poison Path Herbal, which is out front, um, that goes over specific plants, their characteristics, their correspondences, their magical uses, medicinal uses, how to formulate with them, how to plant with them, other resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that will kind of tell you everything that you need to know about them and why you would want to work with them, uh, whether it is magically, entheogenically, or medicinally. Um, so just communication and transmission of information. So bringing the intermediary of the mushroom in, we're able to connect to these other more dangerous or nefarious entities that we might not be as comfortable reaching out with just yet, or gives us the ability to connect with them while consuming very, very small doses through the um, intermediary of the mushroom, myconosis. Cannabis. It's almost time for mine. <laughs> um, so uplifting, stimulating, great for ecstatic trance work. So we've got the, um, the title of the book. I'm not going to plug it because I don't Oh, it's right down there at the bottom. <laughs> the Ecstasy of Shiva and the Calm of Buddha. So with cannabis, we can go two totally different directions um, depending on the intention, depending on the strain, and we can kind of apply that to the specific workings that we're going to be doing, um, some being more meditative and inhibitory, others more stimulating and um, excitatory. Couple glyphs, if anybody has any questions that they wanna throw up just in the last couple minutes, I'm really happy to answer anything. Um, this is a really, really broad topic. There's a lot of angles, a lot of plants, and a lot of um, things that I could talk about. But the most important thing is just maintaining that connection. Um, once a plant ally has sort of presented itself to you, kind of following that connection, listening to the natural world, um, paying attention to other things that come through, um, communicating via other oracles, whether whether it's runes, um, bones, cards, and, and getting those, those insights and that information from different sources um, as well as the plant spirits communicate through them. Here are some books that I've suggested. Uh, it looks like Psychedelic Mysteries of the Feminine has sold out. Um, and you can also find mine up there. If you have any questions, comments, or are interested in working with poisonous plants, either medicinally or magically, uh, you can follow me at Poisoner's Apothecary. And um, also have a, a resource page up there where you guys can read about um, some of the, the history, folklore, and magical uses of nightshades, wolfsbane, mandrakes, which are also nightshades, um, and all of the, the most special plants. So, thank you.
Thank you so much, Kobe Michael, my witchy brother. Thank you.